So, last lecture, we saw the proof of the Banach fixed point theorem. So now we know that if we have a complete matrix space and a contraction mapping, so that's a function from the metric space to itself uh, with this contraction condition, gamma, the contraction factor, uh, then there's a unique fixed point, and moreover, that fixed point can be computed as the limit of any iterated application of our contraction mapping f to an arbitrary point in the space. And we also know that given a compact space x and a complete metric space y, that the space of functions from x to y is a complete metric space with the submetric. So that's a natural uh, domain of application for the fixed point theorem, and that's what we're going to do today. <clears throat> All right, so. Now, these methods are going to apply somewhat more generally to what I'm going to set up at the beginning, uh, but they're very easy extensions of the simplest case. So I'm going to focus on first order, um, let's spell it out once, so ordinary differential equation. It's an equation in an unknown function which is differentiable and whose derivative is continuous. Uh, I mean, phi might only be defined on some interval. Anyway, let's leave sort of unspecified for the moment exactly what the domain of phi is, but it's a real valued uh, function. the form that okay now usually you're a little imprecise when you talk about first order ODE say in a first year calculus course or maybe even a second year course um, you just sort of write the right hand side as some function of the independent variable x and this sort of unknown function phi uh, but really what you mean is, is what I've written there, which is Okay, so U is some, U is some open subset of R, H is a continuous function, and uh, this is the usual notation we've been talking about when we've talked about the product space. So this is the function from r to r squared, which sends x to the pair x phi x. OK, so the left and right hand side are both continuous functions, and they can be equal or not. Solutions are functions for which they're equal. Um, now, usually, you know, you'd maybe write that as Okay, that's just an equivalent way of writing it. Okay, so that's our first order ordinary differential equation. The methods I'm going to present don't really generalize to PDEs. Okay, this is sort of something about ODEs. <coughs> now, the way I motivated the fixed point business last lecture was that interesting equations, for example, finding a root of a function in Newton's algorithm, uh, can be translated by some process to fixed point equations. So the question we want to now analyze is, can we translate the problem of finding a solution to that equation, an ODE? Uh, can we formulate it as the solution to a fixed point problem? Question. 
This is not quite as immediate as Newton's algorithm, at least not in a useful way. Uh, can we translate? So let's call it star. So let's derive it. Um, so what would that mean? Well, that would mean that we had some function f, which is a function of functions. So it takes a phi and gives you back some other function. So it's going to be something like a mapping from a space of continuous functions to itself, such that the fixed points are precisely the same thing as continuous maps, which make that, or differentiable maps, which make that equation true. Uh, I've left out some hypothesis. I mean, u is, h is not defined everywhere necessarily, so I'd also want to restrict the phi's so that the image of that map, one comma phi, actually lands in u. Okay, this will all come out in the details in a minute. Um, so this is what we're trying to do. So we're trying to figure out a function f such that this, these two conditions um, are equivalent. Well. This old trick again. Suppose we succeeded. Uh, and then what would f have to be? Well, I just differentiate both sides of this equation and use that, and I'll see what f has to be. Right. Okay, so if this was the case, that these two were equivalent, then we would have that d dx of f of phi would be equal to, for any fixed point, would be equal to that. And if it was the case that fixed points were precisely solutions, then that would have to be this. All right. <clears throat> but then at least up to a constant, that would mean that this function, which is the image under f of phi, would have to be some constant plus um, the integral of this. Well, depends how you want to write it. If I just mean an antiderivative. Okay, so let's. Okay, so that would have to be the case, at least for the fixed points. So that gives a natural guess for what the transformation f has to be. So notice that that's actually a functional definition, right? Given a phi, I can write down the right-hand side. So that's actually a function which takes a phi and gives you a new function. So that's a candidate for an f. Um, now I need to fix that constant, obviously, in order to write it down as a function, which means that I'm not actually wanting to solve an ODE. I'm wanting to solve an initial value problem. Okay, so let's add. Let's add an initial value, and then that gives me a base point for the integral to put there, and then I want to put y zero there, right? Because then um, f of phi, if evaluated at x zero, that's zero, so it gives me y zero, right? So. Incorporating the initial value problem, I've got a reasonable guess for what f has to be. And, well, the point is that it works. All right, I mean, that only really described what f had to be at the fixed point, but that's a reasonable guess in general. Okay, so let's prove the theorem. Now that, so far nothing is guaranteeing that, that f, I mean, it may be well defined for any continuous phi. Uh, but there's nothing to guarantee that's actually a contraction, right? So that's an additional hypothesis that we have to add. Okay, so take any continuous function, u an open subset of R2.
take some point, which is going to be the initial value. Well, now is the hypothesis that will give rise to the contraction condition. So suppose there exists think about this as a vector field that you're trying to follow that just says that the rate of change vertically of the slope of the vector field is not too steep. Okay, I'll draw a picture in a minute and repeat that comment. Uh, but that's, so it's important here that the x is the same x and y1 and y2 are any points such that those both lie in the domain. Okay. So for all So that's the condition. And there exists a delta such that in a sort of closed ball of radius delta around the initial value of x, we can solve the initial value problem and solve it uniquely. So that's Picard's theorem. should be precise about what I mean by a solution. So a solution is a continuously differentiable function that just makes this equation true and satisfies that. Okay. Uh, maybe for lack of time, I, I'll go back on my promise to draw the vector field. Uh, it's in the notes. I think you're all familiar with this idea to some degree. Most of you have even seen some version of this statement, I expect, if not the proof. Okay, so that's, that's the claim. <clears throat> okay, so, well, we've got to get ourselves into a position of having a complete metric space, and we know more or less what the contraction mapping has to be. Uh, so it's just a matter of putting all that together. take some small rectangle around x, well, I mean preferably as large as possible because we want the solution to exist on the largest interval possible, so maybe I shouldn't say small. Let's take some square around centered at the initial value x0, y0, and which is contained in u. Right? That's the only place we can make sense of the de, so that's okay. So we're trying to find this solution uh, within this interval. Um, all right.
So here we're going to use compactness. So that's a compact space, that product of intervals. And h is continuous on it. So the restriction is bounded. Uh, let's say. capital M. All right, so this is, uh, well, let me explain the problem that I'm sort of anticipating by extracting this bound M, which is I need this to be a function from some space of functions to itself, right? The space of functions is going to be, well, those functions whose graph lies in that square, which is to say continuous maps from i to j. That's, that's the arena where I'm looking for solutions. It's the space of functions I want to care about is this. Now, the trick there is that I need this formula on the right-hand side. If I plug something whose range is contained in j into it, I need the range of the output to be contained in j. But that means I'm going to have to have something to do with the bound of h so that I can arrange for that to be the case. Right? So that's what this... That's why I'm paying attention to the, to the bounds of h on this uh, square. All right, so we've got that bound. <coughs> and, okay, so here's the technical conditions we need for this to work. So we need an interaction between the width of i and the constraint alpha which is provided to us and also between delta and m. Right? Okay, so just to make it clear, uh, alpha is given to us and, well, m is sort of interdependent with b, right? Because m was the bound uh, and the bound is on i cross j, which involves b. So those two aren't uh, independent. But we can certainly arrange for both of those to be true, this one by taking delta sufficiently small, and this one by leaving b fixed and taking delta to be sufficiently small. Okay. Uh, so we may assume that by shrinking delta. Now, as we'll see when we discuss actual examples in a minute, I mean, that's sort of annoying that we have to sort of keep shrinking delta because that's restricting the domain where we can talk about the solution. So that's a bit annoying, uh, but nonetheless, we'll do it. Okay, so we look for solutions to the initial value problem, as I said, uh, in the space which is... Okay, so once we've arranged all these constants correctly, we leave them fixed. Okay, so now we've got a fixed i and j, and we're looking at this space. promised, let's make sense of that formula over there as as an actual, well, continuous, in fact, contraction mapping. Uh, that's a metric space, right? Uh, I mean, give J the induced metric as a subset of R, that's a complete metric space because it's a closed subset of a complete metric space. And then that's compact, so this is a complete metric space uh, with the submetric. All right, so we've got a complete metric space. Now I claim we have a contraction mapping on it, and then we're done, right? Okay, so, well, what have I got to do? I've got to convince you, first, that's well-defined, that this formula actually makes sense, not only that it gives you a continuous map, but that the range of that continuous map is contained in J. And secondly, I need to convince you it's a contraction mapping. Uh, 
And thirdly, I guess I just need to put together more precisely the comments earlier to convince you that a fixed point of this F is precisely a solution, but that's sort of easy. And then, then we're done with the theorem. Okay. So uh, maybe I should make, maybe we should dwell for a minute on this formula. So uh, x could be less than x0, right? The x is here. I mean, maybe I should be more precise. So, so f of phi, phi is an element here. It's supposed to be a continuous map from this interval to that interval. Uh, for the moment, let's just think about it as a real valued function on i. So it's the real valued function whose value at an x, which is between x0 minus delta and x0 plus delta, is given by integrating from x0 to x. Well, x could be less than x0. Take that with a negative sign in the usual way. That's some continuous function of t, t lying in this interval. And we can perform the integral. I mean, that's continuous, so it's Riemann integrable. All right. So you integrate that, and that's a well-defined real number. So that's the value of f of phi on x. Okay, so uh, continuity, well, so maybe let's for the moment just convince ourselves f is a function which takes values in continuous maps from i to r. So why is this a continuous function of x? Well, I mean, that's... Uh, it's differentiable, right? That's the fundamental theorem of calculus, so therefore it's continuous. So that's a continuous function of x. So at least that formula gives me a well-defined function, f, with values here. I'm not saying f is continuous yet, and I don't know yet that the range of f of phi is actually contained in j. Those remain to be argued. Okay, so that's the first thing we've got to check, is that for that will allow me to erase that R and put a J in there. Okay, so why is that? <laughs> well, so what do I need to show? I mean, J is numbers that are within a distance less than, the distance to Y0 is less than or equal to B. Okay, so to show the image of F of phi is in that interval, I just need to show this expression its distance to y0 is less than or equal to b. Well, that distance is just this integral formula. Okay, so I just need to estimate that as having absolute value less than or equal to b. <coughs> I mean, for the, for the moment, let's just... I'll just do the x greater than or equal to x0 case. The other case, I mean, it's just it's the same thing. All right, well. Now this. And here's where we use this here, right? Now. By hypothesis, for every t in x0, between x0 and x, uh, I mean, keep in mind, okay. and when I'm evaluating this formula, the x is taken as an input to f of phi, so it's in i, right? So for any x in i, if I look at this integral, well, then phi of t for any t between x0 and x by hypothesis is in j because that's what I assumed phi was. It sends i into j. So that's in uh, i and that's phi of t is in j. But that means that I'm in this condition, right? x and y, I'm plugging in a point in i cross j. So this expression here is less than or equal to m dt. So that's m. Ah, but, well, 
we arranged this for this particular reason, right? So that's less than or equal to m delta, uh, which is less than b. I guess I'd, maybe I don't even need this strict inequality here, do I? OK, so this difference is less than b, which means that this thing I'm adding there has absolute value less than b. Do this for the case x less than x0 as well, which shows you that f of 5x lies in the interval j. And so I'm done. So that shows you that at least this formula is a well-defined function from the relevant complete metric space to itself. Remains to show it's a contraction. Any questions so far? Well, OK, so to show it's a contraction, we just have to analyze the distance between f of phi and f of phi prime for two functions phi and phi prime. What do I call them? Phi psi. Well, by definition, that's the supremum. the definition of the submetric. Uh, oh yeah, thank you. Right. <laughs> Otherwise, um, I'm done already with alpha equals one. Huh? Yeah, thanks. So if we look at the formula, well, the y zeros cancel when I do that subtraction. So I'm just left with the difference between the integral parts. So, well, the integral is linear, so I just write that as a single integral, and then I use the same inequality that the absolute value of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. And you can see the condition involving the alpha appearing. out in a bit more detail. So to prove this, this supremum is less than or equal to that supremum, I just have to show everything in each one of these uh, for each t is less than or equal to that. And uh, oh, I've got, I apologize. There's, there's two t's here, right? One of them shouldn't be a t. Yeah. So I was using x before for a reason. So this, I mean, otherwise, what is the x that I'm putting here? Yeah, this is x. I apologize. Yeah, so I take the supremum over all x in i of this difference, and then I look at the formula, which says f of phi of x is that stuff. The integral is over t, and the x is the bound. OK, so that's where the x went. So this is still x. That's still x. And the integral is over dt. So to show that inequality, I just need to show each one of these expressions for each x is less than or equal to that expression, but then it's less than or equal to one of them because of the inequality on the integrals, and therefore it's less than or equal to the supreme. Alrighty. So then we just look at our condition. Right? 
take phi of t, psi of t, Quality, and we get that that's less than or equal to alpha times this. Now, okay, so the alpha, of course, just comes out the front. Now I can bound this integral above by the, I mean, these guys here. Uh, each less than or equal to the d infinity distance between phi and psi, right? Because that's the supremum of all those distances over all t. So I'm integrating over t, but I'll get at most the length of the interval times the maximum value that can possibly attain, right? Okay, so that's less than or equal to x minus x0 times the supremum Now this really is a t. Uh, I should not say that. Supremum over uh, t in x0. Well, x could be less than x0. Um, well, anyway. I don't want this to depend on x, so I'm free to put here t in i. This may, I'm not integrating over all t and i necessarily, right? So this suprema may be a value that is never attained by that absolute value, if, say, x is very close to x0. But in any case, the maximum value attained by that expression there is certainly less than that supremum over a bigger set. So that inequality is still correct. All right? So what's that? Well. That's the d infinity distance, and that's less than or equal to delta. So that's less than or equal to alpha delta times the d infinity distance from phi to psi. Okay, so that was the that's an inequality for the thing inside this supremum. So what I've got in the end is that the d infinity distance from f of phi to f of psi. less than or equal to alpha delta. Right? If every one of those expressions for every x in i is less than or equal to this, and that has nothing to do with x, then that supremum has to be less than or equal to that. And well, we chose that to be less than 1, so that's my constant. That's my gamma. So we have a contraction map. And then, so then we're done. Right? Uh, so I need to make a couple of brief remarks to, to connect the dots, but. First of all, the fixed point theorem tells us that that function f has a unique fixed point. Let's call it phi star. And now we've just got to convince ourselves that the fixed points of f are precisely the same things as solutions of the initial value problem on i. OK. So in one direction. Well, if it was a solution, um, then integrating both sides, well, you'll see that that formula is correct. 
Right? So from the fact that it's a solution, we would derive that it's a fixed point just by integrating both sides and using that the integral of phi prime is phi. Uh, and if it is a fixed point, well, if it's a fixed point, then it phi is equal to f of phi, which is equal to the right-hand side there. That right-hand side there is differentiable because the integral of anything continuous is a differentiable function. So phi is therefore differentiable and has a continuous derivative because well, the derivative is itself. Okay, so that must be a continuously differentiable function. And then differentiating both sides of this, well, the right-hand side has derivative h, so we find that it's a solution. Okay, so that's just invoking the fundamental theorem you know, a couple of times. Uh, all right, so well, there's a unique fixed point, and fixed points are precisely solutions, so, so we're done. Um, it's worth noting that you know, we weren't restricting to differentiable functions when we set up this problem. I mean, we knew the solutions had to be differentiable, but the, contra the contraction mapping and the fixed point, you know, the application of the fixed point theorem was to a space of continuous functions. The fixed points were all differentiable because they're solutions, but this was taking place in this wider setting of continuous functions. Uh, and I should say there's, you know, there's many variations of this theorem, um, and some of the variations will remove, well, will deal better with this restriction that I'm just talking about now at the cost of making the metric that you take a little more complicated. Um, so I put a reference to a book by Cheney in the notes. If you look at that, you'll see a slightly modified argument. But, you know, I don't have time to go into too many of the variations. Um, okay, so maybe I'll mention the obvious extensions. So it's absolutely routine to extend this to the case of a system of DEs. Right? So in that case, H just takes values in Rn rather than R, and you've got a family of differential equations. So you've got phi 1 prime through phi n prime, computed the right-hand side, H1 through Hn. Now that's in exactly the same way we prove this. You set up and solve a fixed point problem to show existence of solutions in that case with an appropriate condition on the H, or the H's. And once you have systems of DEs, you can do the usual trick to solve higher order DEs, right? So you can use this to solve uh, higher order ordinary differential equations. Okay, so those restrictions made here are not really meaningful. Uh, that is, they can be removed with a little bit of work. Okay, so I want to do uh, an example quickly. Now, so this wasn't too much work, I would say, the proof, uh, once we had the fixed point theorem, uh, but it's kind of remarkable the degree to which this underpins uh, much of, say, differential geometry, this, this theorem. And one interesting thing about it is it doesn't just tell us that solutions exist, right? It tells us, in principle, how to find them, because we just need to iterate that f. Mark. Okay, so take the f that I wrote down, and well, we iterate it starting with any element we like of CTS ij. And well, the most obvious continuous function from i to j. Uh, is just the constant function y0, because we know y0 is in there. So. Okay, so just take the constant function y0, keep iterating that function, and you're guaranteed to converge to a solution with respect to d infinity, which is uniform convergence. Okay, so that's kind of awesome. And then if you, well, you plug in, you know, the simplest DEs you can think of, uh, and you'll get out the usual 
approximations of interesting functions by limits of polynomials. Right? So let's try the exponential function, for instance. So just take h x y as y. So that's a continuous function from R two to R. So our u is just everything. And the differential equation is uh, is just phi prime of x equals h of x phi prime h of x phi x and well h of x phi x is just phi x so that's the ODE we're solving and as our initial condition let's take well <laughs> we get to choose right Yeah, I wrote down a kind of funny, I wrote down something wrong in the notes here. I put down phi zero is one, which doesn't actually fit with what I did. Um, well, no, sorry, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, so, so what's the iteration? So take this to be y zero, which is one. And then the next point of the iteration, so that's f of phi 0, which is just, look at the formula, it's 1 plus the integral from x0, that's 0, to x. Right, so this is, I'm writing my functions as functions of x. Of, well, h of x phi x, and the phi I'm putting in is this guy, which is just the constant 1. So that's 1 dt. So that's just 1 plus x. And then phi 2 of x, so that's f of phi 1. It's 1 plus the integral from 0 to x of 1 plus t dt. and repeat. So by induction, you can prove that the nth iterate as a function will just be this sum. Oh, so that means the solution I mean, we know these iterates converge to the solution is the limit as n goes to infinity of that sequence of functions. Well, of course, we recognize that as a description of the function e to the x. Okay, so that's the kind of observation that's coming out of this uh, fixed point method. How do we know that this is valid on the whole? No, no, yeah, that's a good question. Right, I'm not saying anything about delta here, but delta was a part of the story over there, so yeah, that's a, a perfectly good objection. Uh, all that the theorem tells me is that this is true, that is, that this is a solution. So Picard says, this is a solution, a unique solution, but only on, well, x0 is 0, so that's minus delta to delta. Well, in principle, I also had to check this condition, right? I had to check the h satisfied that condition, but, well, if I just take alpha to be condition I needed to apply Picard's theorem was this, and that's just y1 and that's y2 in this example. So any alpha which is greater than or equal to 1 will be sufficient. Uh, I mean, I can take alpha equals 1, but I want to maybe take it bigger for the purpose I'm about to explain. Okay, so to apply Picard's theorem, I just needed that, so that's fine. 
and then it'll guarantee there's some delta greater than zero such that there's a unique solution and it will tell me that the solution is this. So in fact, all I knew is that this limit is a solution on some interval that looks like that. But if I look at the proof, I can find out a little bit more about what delta will work. I mean, I want delta to be as big as possible, right? I need alpha delta to be less than one and m delta to be less than b. Uh, b I sort of got to choose and then m depended on the b. Right. So, So uh, when you work it out, I think uh, as long as you take your delta to be less than 1, you can arrange all of that. Uh, so this tells me then that tells me that at least on this interval, Picard's theorem just tells me that on that interval we have a unique solution given by, given by e to the x. Now we know that differential equation has a solution, namely e to the x, on all of R. Um, so how do we reconcile those two facts? Well, what you can do is you can just now solve the DE on a changed interval. Uh, I mean, there's various ways of going about this, but so one way is this. So. So we were solving the DE, well, the initial value problem, on that interval. We found it had a unique solution. Now we can just move the initial value problem with the same differential equation and now talk about the initial value problem which has x0 equals 1 and y0 equals e. Uh, apply Picard's theorem again. As you'll notice, alpha can still be greater, anything greater than or equal to 1. So apply the Picard theorem again. That'll tell you there's a delta around 1 on which there's a unique solution, which must, must again be e to the x. And if you look at it, you can see you can take, again, any delta less than 1. So the widths of those intervals aren't shrinking as you go along. So you can just keep doing that. So you can just keep extending the solution in either direction. Now, in general, of course, it depends on the DE. I mean, maybe you can't extend the solution because maybe it blows up or something happens to the vector field. Okay, so this is not a general phenomena that you can extend to all of R. Uh, all right, so that's one way of dealing with this, with this restriction. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, so uh, I want to flag one thing for next time, which is this fact that we found our solutions as a uniform limit of polynomials is actually a deep fact. So what we've observed here is not just that we could find solutions and not just that we could find solutions as limits of some arbitrary collection of functions, but that we could find them as limits of polynomials because as long as h is polynomial, we can always take our initial function to be a constant and then integrals of constants of polynomials, in particular if you iterate f and the starting point of the iteration is a polynomial, you're just integrating polynomials, so you're still poly dealing with polynomials. So that's a consequence of Picard's theorem, is that you can always approximate solutions by polynomial functions. And that's actually, there's a broader fact, which is that any continuous function can be uniformly approximated by a sequence of polynomials. So that's the stone weierstrass theorem. That's what we're going to do uh, in the next two lectures. Okay, so I'll stop there.